Matthew 26, 41. Thanks for helping you guys. The Bible says in Matthew 26, 41. Who's going to read that, please? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Mm -hmm. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want to talk about temptation. Now, this picture up here, oh, that's a great, good job, you guys. Uh, this is a famous painting that I saw at the Louvre. I took the picture when I was there, uh, where Satan is tempting Jesus. You know the story. And uh, temptation is something really, really interesting. And I don't know if you've ever, anybody ever felt tempted here? Almost everybody here. And if someone's hand's not up, just look at them and say, you were tempted to lie right there, weren't you? <laughs> Come on, just admit it. Temptation is common to mankind. It says, watch and pray lest you enter. And I want you to underline the word enter. I never noticed it. It says enter into temptation. People have said, well, I, can f I fell into temptation. That's a good word too. But the Bible calls it entering into temptation. Temptation is something you enter into, which is very significant. To know how to get out of it, you got to know that you actually get into it. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let's talk about that. Well, we all know it's a story. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. He says, can you pray with me? Life is rough. He knew that he was going to have to drink of the cup. It was a battle for him spiritually. That's the context of the story. As you know, he comes out. Instead of praying, they're sleeping. And what he says here, he says the spirit is willing. The word willing there means your spirit is predisposed to move forward. Everybody say, my spirit is predisposed to move forward. Now some of you know that you're predisposed to heart problems because of your family. Some of you know that you're predisposed to diabetes because of your family. And that's why they do family histories when you go to a doctor. But that can be broken by the blood of Jesus Christ. We believe that, that we can pray against whatever genealogical uh, uh, curses that have been passed down in your family, whether it's alcoholism or obesity or whatever it might be. We believe we can pray against it. But we're predisposed towards something until God changes it. Now in this case, it says the spirit is predisposed to move you forward, but the flesh, everybody say my flesh, is weak. The word weak there means feeble. So in other words, if I want, to re I want to really be a Christian, I really want to do well, I really want to resist temptation, and you're doing it in your own flesh, guess what? The Bible says it's feeble. How many of you have ever wanted to do something and not been able to do it? Lift up your hand. How many ever want to say no to temptation but fail? Lift up your hand. Just keep your hands up. Because <laughs> the Bible says... You know, you're willing, I'm going to will it, I'm going to will it, I'm going to will it. No, 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 no. It's your spirit moves you forward, but your flesh, including your mind, is, is feeble. It's feeble. Without the spirit, you are feeble. And when you understand that, it's very, very powerful. Now, the word temptation is an important word. It means the testing of your faith, the testing of your character, and the testing of your beliefs. So you have to understand what temptation is. It's a test. Everybody say, it's a test. You're watching online, it's a test. When you're being tempted, something or someone is testing you. And you got to understand that. The only thing that you can have that can help you overcome temptation is your spirit. Spirit strengthened by his spirit, because you know your body, soul, and spirit. You know that, right? Your body, soul, and spirit. Your soul and your body are what's called flesh. They're weak. But your spirit can be strong and can help you overcome the battle. Now, let's talk about that. I want to go into this in detail. How many of you have really thought about this for a second? Because when you look at it, when you're tempted, you're tempted into something. So you're tempted to live in fear. You're tempted to, to let fear control you. You're tempted in, to live in bitterness. You're tempted to live in offenses. How many of you ever known anybody who lived in pride? Stubbornness compromise, immorality, abuse of drugs or alcohol. You see, temptation is something you enter into. It's a test. And if you fail the test, you end up living in that temptation. Almost every single temptation has a physiological connection to it. Almost every single one. 
If you look at pornography, it releases chemicals in your brain that makes you addicted to that type of chemical release in your body, in your brain. Almost every, te every temptation, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, pornography, uh, whatever, gambling, all of them are connected physiologically. Did you know that? So a gambleholic, that's actually someone that when they start gambling, it releases chemicals in their brain that strengthens that behavior. Maybe you didn't know that. When you drink alcohol, it releases certain chemicals in your brain that you get used to. So when we talk about breaking temptation, we have to realize that temptation is literally something we go into and we end up being living in it because it's actually physiological, it is spiritual, it is emotional, and oftentimes it has a relational component. When you think of temptations, it's never just one component. Have you ever noticed that someone that goes for a detox, it's usually 28 to 30 days. How many know it's true? Why? Because it takes four days to remove one toxic thought from your brain. It takes 21 days to start establishing healthy thoughts in your brain. That's why all the detox programs are 28 to 30 days. All of them. Why? Because it has to break four connections. It's got to break the emotional connection. It's got to break the physiological connection. It's got to break the relational connection. It's got to break the spiritual connection. So this is something that I've never even anybody talk about this stuff. I've been studying it and I'm starting to get the understanding of why it's so hard for people to break out of whatever temptation that was. It's because all of a sudden it's like, that's why they call it bondage. Because physiologically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually, people get in bondage and they end up living in that temptation. Does that make sense to anybody? Am I going too deep? I don't want to fluff things over. I'm going to continue this probably next week. We're going to see how, what the Lord says, but I really want to go deep on this because most people don't talk about this. So a temptation generally starts with a thought, a desire, a lack, a trauma, a lie. It turns into addiction, which turns into a bondage, emotional, physical, relational, spiritual. Why do you say it starts with a thought? Because that's where everything starts, right here. Now, now, sometimes it starts with trauma. Let's say um, someone is, is sexually abused as a child. It traumatizes them, and oftentimes that person will struggle with a host of difficulties. I've talked to a lot of young men that were struggling with homosexuality. I've I, and I love homosexual men. I just bless them. I want to help them because guess what? They're struggling with temptations that I don't struggle with, but I struggle with other ones. And so to say... Pastor, are you, are you a homophobe? No, I, I love homosexuals. I feel bad that they're struggling with that, and I want to find out why. What was the root cause of that? When I was a therapist, I always helped people with their temptations. You wouldn't believe the stuff that I help people with. And it always went back to either trauma or a thought. And many times, people that were sexually abused will end up having struggles with sexuality, whether it's temptation with the same sex or opposite sex or bondage. All kinds of stuff can happen because of trauma. But there's also lies. What happens if you feel that you're ugly and, and, and you feel like you're an ugly person? Guess what? You may have to, you, you may try to gain the approval of others to prove to yourself that you're not ugly. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that start. See, the thing is, what's the root of your addiction? What's the root of the temptation that you're living in right now? Now, maybe not you, but the other Christian down the road, he's living with temptations. So today, I want you to start to think about what is your temptation? What is the thing that, that lures you the most? It could be that extra Krispy Kreme donut. Can I tell you why? Because oftentimes children use food to comfort themselves. Drugs and alcohol? What's that? That's, that's you becoming your own doctor. I'm having trouble handling my stress. I'm having trouble handling uh, what I'm going through emotionally. Well, what do I do? I take drugs. I take alcohol. It sedates me. In other words, you're becoming your own doctor and you're prescribing stuff to yourself. It's all connected, and I know a lot of people don't talk about this, but I really want to really empower you because even if you're not struggling, even if you're not living in temptation right now, it's going to help you avoid temptation because it is a test and it has long-term consequences. Anybody still here? Okay, let's talk about the... Did we get the AC on yet? Thanks, guys. Is it getting better? Truths about temptation. Let's go into the Bible. Uh, Luke chapter 4, 13. Read it, please. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The painting you saw at the beginning showed Jesus being tempted 
by the devil. So don't, be, don't feel bad that you're tempted. I know Christians, I feel so guilty that I'm tempted. Why do you feel guilty? Jesus was tempted. Get over it. <laughs> you will be tempted. Everybody say, I'm going to be tempted. Jesus was tempted. I know some people beat themselves up simply because they had a temptation. And they, they haven't even started fighting it yet. They're still feeling bad that they even had one. And that's a ploy of the enemy. You're going to be tempted. You're going to have weird dreams at night. You're going to think stupid things. You're going to have thoughts go through your brain. I'm not saying where they're coming from yet, but I'm going to tell you, you got all stuff in your brain. And you got to realize this. Temptation is normal. But Jesus resisted every single temptation. And after Satan was done tempting him, what did he do? He left till another opportunity. In other words, if you understand the word of God, Satan left him because Jesus overcame every temptation and Satan then waited for another opportune time. You understand? Everybody, are you, are we, is this ICLV? <laughs> Bob's here, so it must be ICLV. All right, David Escobar is here. Are you getting this? It has an end. Every temptation has an end. It's temporary. Number two truth. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Golly. Okay. Everybody say, Christ knows how to deliver me. So in other words, if there's a temptation that's try, trying to draw you away from God's best, because that's what temptation does. It draws you away from God's best. Wanting to ensnare you and cause you to be in bondage. That's what temptation does. You, literally, temptation is simply the open door to be in bondage. To food, to alcohol, to whatever, to sex, whatever, to a relationship. But everybody say, Christ knows how to deliver me. Every say, Christ knows how to deliver me. So it doesn't freak him out that you're being tempted, friends. It doesn't freak him out. He knows how to deliver you and he wants to provide that to you. Thirdly, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Oh. But with the temptation <laughs> will also make... The way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Oh, okay. Keep that scripture up there. Okay. I know when I was a therapist, people would say, man, I, I'm, I had these thoughts. And they think they're like the worst person in the world. I go, well, no, a lot of people have those thoughts. Huh? What? And they look at my response, seeing if I'm going to react to them. And I didn't react. I said, man, everybody, a lot of the people have those temptations. What? <laughs> See, it says, what you think is that you're the only one that ever felt depressed. You're the only one that ever felt so addicted. You're the only one that ever had those crazy thoughts. And, and the Bible says, you're not the only one. It's common to man. But God won't let you be tempted beyond what you're able to handle. Everybody say it with me. God won't let me be tempted beyond what I'm able. God won't let me be tempted beyond what I'm able. You know, Pasquale, I think it's the AC up here that's not up. If they can help me, I'm really hot up here. Um, now, if you get this, get this in your mind. Literally, he promises that he, <laughs> he already put something in you that's going to help you resist that temptation. When I was growing up, the song was, Devil in a blue dress, blue dress, blue dress, devil with a blue dress song. Ow! <laughs> He's going to give you the ability to resist any temptation. It's in you already. God put it in you if you've got the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian. Oh, I like that. But with temptation also will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Everybody say, God can help me escape. God can help me escape. From any addiction, drugs, food, whatever, depression, discouragement, fear. There's all kinds of temptations. It's going to give you a way to escape. What's the fourth one? Matthew chapter 6, 13. Read it, please. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Damn. Why was it so important for Jesus even to mention it in his prayer? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver me. In fact, one version says, deliver me from the evil one. So in other words, Jesus knew that every one of you would be tempted. Look at someone and say, you're tempted too. Come on, don't lie. Come on, just tell me right now. Come on, we're all tempted. <laughs> and Jesus said, he'd been tempted. 
And so, but he overcame it and you can overcome it too. Every temptation you can overcome. Now, where does temptation come from? This is going to be a good thing. There's six quick things. Number one, everybody say Satan. Satan. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, 5. It talks about sexuality here, and I know that's kind of scary to some of you, but uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. Read it, please. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, mm. that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer mm. and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So, so that Satan won't tempt you. In other words, you say, let me help you couples, married couples. It's important that you have sex with each other and guess what, guys, you can go home and say, my pastor said I should have sex with my wife. And that's absolutely true. <laughs> but you better be good to her. <laughs> you better be really nice. It's part of the game plan for men to remain pure in their marriage and for women to remain pure is that husbands should satisfy the wife, the wife should satisfy the husband. That's part of God's plan for you to overcome Satan's attack. I know it sounds weird, but that's the Bible. So one, yeah, some, some guy's going, oh, glory to God. <laughs> so Satan can throw temptations your way, and God just told us that. Ephesians 2, 3. Well, sometimes our temptations come from our own thoughts, our own flesh, and our own fallen nature. Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also... We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, mm. fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, mm. and were by nature children of wrath, mm. just as the others. Okay, so you see three things there. You see flesh, thoughts, and nature. Okay, there's part of you that, that see, your spirit is predisposed to go forward, but here it's saying that your flesh, your mind, and your nature is predisposed to go the other way. So in other words, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, what I want to do, I don't do. What I do want to do, I don't do. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do do. That's what Paul said. <laughs> you see, you got to get to the point where you realize that, that some of it's not just come from Satan. It's coming from right here, from your fallen nature and from the flesh. The third thing is, James 1.14, James is so good when it deals with temptation. Read that, please. But each one is tempted. When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Mm. Tempted by his own desires and enticed. So sometimes it's not only my thoughts, my flesh, and my nature. It's my desires. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. Oh, I, I used to hate when people said, oh, man, I'd die for that piece of pie. It's a piece of pie to die for. <laughs> okay, get ready. <laughs> I hated that st sentence. It's dumb. But it's our desires. How about others? Sometimes sin can come from others. Genesis 39, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. Mm. And she said, lie with me. And she wasn't speaking about lying. She was speaking about the other lying. <laughs> Are y'all with me still? So in other words, sometimes there can be devil in the blue dress or devil in the tight jeans or, or, or devil in the slick suit. I don't... I, you got to realize that sometimes others are going to try to entice you. That's just part of temptation. Is sometimes it's going to be a person that will try to bring you up with them. We're going to get to that. The next one is the world. Just underline that and go to Mark 14. But we're going to read the last one, James 4.1. Because the sixth thing, source, the fifth is the world. The sixth is pleasure. Read James 4.1 to just to end this part. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Mm. Do they not come for your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the fifth one is the world. The world's going to always try to entice you and tempt you. That's why around Las Vegas you see, you go into a casino, it's bling, 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 lights, lights, lights. It's all psychological. Everything they do there, I can, I can prove to you psychologically, they're trying to manipulate you to lose your money. I can prove it. I can prove it. I can prove it. It goes back to uh, Pavlov's dog. Operant conditioning and classical conditioning. It's lights, bing, 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 flashes, flash. Why are, why are all that stuff? Why there's no clocks on the walls of the casino? Because they're trying to manipulate people through classical psychological conditioning to get you to lose your money. It's so obvious. Why doesn't everybody see it? They even make it easy for you. They can attach an umbilical cord to your little purse or your wallet, and then it comes out there, and there's a little thing, a string that goes from it, and you stick it in there. 
the world, guess what? And Las Vegas is probably the best in the world at tempting you. It's probably the best at te- That's why there's still, even though supposedly we're in a recession, there's over 200,000 people that still come to Las Vegas every single weekend. 200,000. We've convinced the world this is a playground for adults. Come on, baby. Come on over here. Give us your money. And Vegas is really good at that. It's the world and it's pleasure. Lots of pleasure. There's even a place in town called the Pleasure Palace. I was listening to the radio the other day, to sports radio, and all of a sudden it was come to the, I don't know what the place was called, the Palomino uh, Gentleman's Club, whatever. And, um, and it says this 18,000 square feet of pleasure. 18,000 square feet? Give me a break. What, what is there in 18,000 square feet? Of, I mean, it's just kind of, but that's Vegas. How many more places worldwide are there, there, there are nudie bars that are 18,000 square feet? Vegas is good at it. It's pleasure. Come pleasure, 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 pleasure. The world is trying to pull you and I in so we end up compromising and getting off of what God's called us to do. Like the woman went after uh, uh, Joseph, but it's vice versa too. It doesn't have to be a woman. It can be a man going after a woman. There's all kinds of things going on. Can someone say amen? Does that make sense, everybody? Am I going too deep? All right, I'm just going in the Bible, and I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I feel that's my job, right? Is to help you know what the Bible says, right? So we can live out the Bible, true or untrue. The next slide is a really cool slide. It's, it's an armor from the Louvre. Uh, there's lots of armor there, and um, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, I've been to war museums before, too, and, but this was from the Louvre, and it's a beautiful decorated, uh, I think it's bronze um, shield. And, and what, what I was thinking about is God... God's weapons, Henry, to overcome any type of temptation, whether it's to live in fear or live in immorality, whatever it might be, whatever the te- that God gives us the armor of God. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. And the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but the powerful of pulling down the strongholds. So I want to tell you something before we go today. I want to give you just a couple. I'll give you four or five. I'm going to give you four or five quick tools to overcome temptation. Because once you walk into the door of temptation, remember that old saying, sin will always bring you further than you want, keep you there longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to spend. Temptation is the door that once you walk through the door, you are now in temptation. You failed the test. You're now living in a place you don't want to live. You're going to stay there longer than you want to stay. You're going to, you're, you're going to, you're going to go further than you ever wanted to go. And it's going to cost you more than you ever wanted to spend. So what can we do to avoid temptation and to overcome temptations? Five weapons to avoid and get out of temptation. Number one, we go back to Matthew. It says, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. Now, the word watch means to be vigilant, watchful, awake. Everybody say, watch. Watch. Look around. There's temptations everywhere, and you've got to be alert. All right, got to be alert. People that have fallen into temptation, they always come to me or to one of our team members. Man, I never thought that would lead to this. I would never thought I'd have an affair. Well, it started online. They were chatting online. Before you knew it, they were sending pictures of themselves. And then before you knew it, they were sending pictures of themselves in bikinis or, or bathing suits. Or, and before you knew it, they were meeting for coffee. And before you knew it, bam! I'm telling you, start it somewhere. Watch. Watch out for each other. Husbands, watch out for your wives. Wives, watch out for your husbands. Watch out for each other. Watch out for your children. (sighs) Watch out for your kids. Don't put your computer, their computer, in a place where they're all alone behind a closed door. You should put your family computer in a family place where everybody sees little Johnny doing his studies. Because right now, pornography is rampant. The pedophiles are going on the internet to get your kid going on chat rooms. You should never put your computer in a private place. You put it in a public place. You thank me for this one day. Your kids are going to get angry at you though. But I'm telling you right now, I'm giving you some advice as someone who knows the counseling end and the, the biblical end. And I'm a reader too. Right now, pedophiles are online trying to get your kid. I'm telling you right now. It doesn't matter how young they are. You watch that show. What's it called? Um... Dateline. They keep nabbing these pedophiles. 
is because it's an addiction for them. And it's a bondage for them. They're in it and they can't get out. So that's why they keep even exposing themselves to being caught, losing career, and losing everything else because it's tied to their relationships. It's tied to their, their spiritual demonic bondages there. It's tied to their, their physiological. I mean, it's all tied together. That's why they can't get out of it. That's why they are easily caught. Well, throw out the line, catch them again. Throw out the line, catch them again. Because that's how strong, once you're in temptation, it's hard to get out. So it's better to avoid it. That's why you say watch. Secondly, pray. Pray. Everybody say pray. Pray, pray, pray. Pray with your friends. Pray the prayer of agreement. Pray yourself. Fast and pray. Pray, 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 pray. Why? So that you don't fall into it. Jesus said it. We should do it too. One of our prayers should not just be God bless me, but God help me not walk in temptation. Lord, help me not fall into temptation. We should be praying that because all of us are vulnerable to fall. Is that true or untrue? All right, so we're praying. Fasting is the third one. Oh, I love this scripture. Matthew 17, 21. Oh, I love this scripture. Read it, please. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. <sighs> Some things won't let go of you until you start fasting. Sure. Some things are going to try to hold on to you and keep you in it. And the only way you can break out is you starve yourself out of that thing. You fast, you pray, you fast television, you fast your computer, you fast relation, whatever it is that you got to fast, you fast it. And I'm telling you, friends, you got to starve it because picture it as a, a boa constructor, constrictor. That boa wants to catch you and strangle you. That's what it does. You know a boa doesn't, I mean, it can bite you, but that's not how it's going to kill you. It's going to squeeze you first. And that's what sin does. That's what temptation does. You get into it, it's going to squeeze you. So you got to starve it. Don't feed it. Get out of there. Fourthly, confession. Someone say confession. confession. James 5.16. Read it, please. Confess your trespasses to one another mm. and pray for one another that you may be healed. Mm. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I had a brother come to me years ago. He said, Pastor, I got a confession. I've been struggling with pornography. I said, come on, brother. Let's pray. We held each other's hands. We prayed. He's never had a problem since. It's probably been 10 years. And all he had to do was confess it. For him to be healed. That's it. The hard part is to confess it. The hard part is to finally say, hey brother, I'm struggling with this. Honey, I'm struggling with this. Uh, I'm struggling with this. And all of a sudden, bam, you expose it to the light and that thing loses its power. Addictions are only strong in the darkness. I've known some addicts, they hide their drugs all over the house. Under pillows, under mattresses, they hide their alcohol. Alcoholics, they'll hide it everywhere. I know it because I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, so I understand the behavior. It's so entwined in who you are. It's your self-sedation. You've got to get to the point where you say, I'm going to break this thing, and probably the only way I can break it is with somebody else's help. I can't do this on my own. Yeah. Counseling. Yeah. Groups. 12, Christians 12-step 12, 12 programs. We're just starting Celebrate Recovery. We started it not too long ago. That's the best thing you can do to get in. You begin to expose it. You begin to get out of it. You begin to break the secret of that addiction. Because Satan wants to keep you isolated because it's easy for him to pick you off. I'm telling you right now, you don't let him have the satisfaction of keeping you in bondage. You begin to confess it. Yeah, it's going to hurt. But it's going to hurt a whole lot more if you stay in bondage another six months, year, two years, ten years, twenty years. Someone say amen. Is it okay if I preach like this? My, go my job is to empower you so that you will not live in temptation and you will not fail that test and something that can damage you and your family and your children grandchildren and the last point is this Genesis 39 verse 11 and 12 please but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work Bam. and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying lie with me but he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside okay I want the worship team to come on up here I call this run Run. Run, Forrest! <laughs> Ladies, some guy at your office is giving you all the nice words. Oh, baby, you're fine. I love your dress. Ooh, honey, I love that perfume. All of a sudden, he starts putting a little honey your way. You know, you tell him, get lost, buddy. You don't let it feed that insecurity, that flesh, whatever's in you that's craving for the acceptance. You shut it off immediately and you get the heck out of there. 
Guys, that lady is exposing parts of her body parts in a public place. And your eyes are drifting. And you start saying, Lord Jesus, bless that girl right now. She's somebody's daughter. And Lord, I, I don't know what she's trying to do right now. Maybe I do, but I'll go pray for her. I'm going to pray that God touches her life. And I'm going to pray that God really ministers to her. And I'm going to get the heck out of there. You got to run, guys. Ladies, you got to run. Don't think that by flirting online, it's safe. It's not safe. It's an open door. Don't think by flirting at the office, it's safe. It's not safe. It's an open door. I got to tell you something, friends. It may feel good to flirt a little bit sometimes. It may feel good to do that kind of stuff. And, but I'll tell you what, it's an open door. And you may not think that you're going to fall. But guess what? Your flesh is weak. You want to make sure that spiritually you're awake enough to go, I'm going to set some good boundaries here. I'm going to set some boundaries here. I can tell you story after story over these years of times where I've encouraged people just to run. Avoid it. Get out of there. I have an addictive personality. I'm not afraid to say that. It's, it's genetic. Passed down. I have addictions in my family history. And guess what? I know that's something I have to be careful about. So when it came time to say no to alcohol, guess what I had to do? I had to not only avoid the alcohol, I had to avoid the bars. I literally, I couldn't even trust myself to go into a bar. Now, at first I said, man, I'm big enough, man. I got Jesus in me. I couldn't go to a bar and not even drink. Ah, I'm so strong. Before you knew it, one, ah, I'm strong enough for one. In my mind, I had this discussion going on with it. I knew it was the enemy, but it was myself maybe, but the enemy, I think it was more the enemy. Paul, you can take one. Come on, one's not going to hurt you. Paul, one's not going to hurt you. Come on, Paul. And I take the one, but then it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. So I knew that for me to, to, to have victory over every temptation, I had to run. I told the story one time when I was at an airport and I was waiting in line and I like to talk to people and whoever will turn around and look at me, I usually talk to, I like to talk about Jesus and, and a, a lady turned around and she had these green, green, green eyes and I, I said, lady, are those eyes real? I, shocked the, I thought she had some type of contact lenses on or something. I said, lady, are your eyes real? She goes, yeah, that's my real eye color. I said, they're beautiful. Right when I said that, I knew I said something really stupid. And she liked that. I could tell she just kind of lit up and smiled at me. And I thought, oh, Jesus, help me. I knew it. Immediately, I had the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So here I'm in line. She's in front of me. And it's Southwest Airlines. So you get to pick your own seat or, you know, sit on someone's lap or whatever. That's been... Sure. It's a cattle call in the, that plane. So I thought, man, I'll let her go first. And... And I didn't realize, but she kind of slipped behind me. And I went and I said, I'm just going to find a place. And I went and found a place. And guess who sat right next to me? That lady. I realized that I made a mistake by saying something nice about her eyes. Because women, if you compliment them, you speak to, you compliment their body parts or whatever else. It goes right here. It gets to their heart. Man, it's right through here. And so something happened there, and so she, she wanted to talk with me. And, and so she, the more she wanted to talk to me, the more I told I said, wow, I got a great wife. I got three great kids. I love Jesus. And I, the more I shared about, I figured I'd share Jesus now because that really turned her off. So now I'm witnessing to her. That's not working. She says, oh, you're such a nice guy. So then I finally pretended I was asleep. I said, you know what, I'm just going to take a little nap right now. So I, I pretended I was asleep. I really, I closed my eyes and for the rest of the flight, I was like, oh. I got off the plane. I went to get my bags. Guess who followed me? She says, hey, listen, you need a lift anywhere? I said, well, no, thanks. I'm fine. She says, no, 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 seriously, I, I'd be glad to give you a lift. I said, no, I'm running a car. It's all good. She says, well, I'll drive you to the car place. And I all of a sudden, right when she said that, I saw my bag coming around. And I'm telling you, I did a Joseph right there. As she's saying it, I grabbed my bag and I ran out like a little girl. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing you can do is run. I immediately call my wife, honey, oh, I'm sorry, I told the girl she had nice eyes. I'm so sorry, oh, honey. Oh, God. I told her the whole story because I'm not going to hide anything. Someone say, run. Someone say, run. 
because you know what temptation is? It gets you in to something. 